welcome. Oh, am I excited about just stuff. You know, it doesn't take much to thrill my soul. So I, we have a, an office building. Uh, it has three offices, a conference room, a kitchen. And then on the second floor, we have like a multi-purpose room, uh, casual. We have a bedroom, spare bedroom for emergencies and another bathroom. Uh, there are three bathrooms downstairs. It's a fairly large office. And outside is just beautifully kept with beautiful flowers and bushes and trees. My uh, nephew mows um, for me. That's his job. He has a, his own company and he um, is so diligent in keeping our place looking great. But we have this vine, <laughs> this insipid vine that it's it just overtakes everything if we don't stay on this vine we have tried to take it out cut it out burn it out chemical it out but every year this vine just comes out of nowhere and takes over our flower beds and my one of my closest friend She's, uh, her family is my family. I call them my own, um, it's my nieces and my nephew. Um, she's as close to me as blood could possibly be. And she and one of her daughters showed up at my office and cleared the whole place of this vine. And when I say it's taking over everything, it was taking over some of the rails on the porch. It was taking over a tree. It was taking over the bushes and flowers and cleared the vine from everything, and it looks absolutely beautiful. That, I don't even really need to preach, do I? That that's how sin and the world can get to us. Little by little, one little vine can wrap itself around us. One little tiny branch of something can entwine us in sin, in rebellion, in disobedience, in sickness, in sadness, and in disbelief. But we need to constantly garden our lives, clear out that vine that so easily entangles us. You were running, Galatians says, you were running so well who entangled you or what entangled you that you fell away from the truth? It was just that sweet reminder that God always gives me when I drove into the parking lot and I saw how beautiful the, the flower beds looked. That was what God spoke to my heart. I said, Jen, you need to make sure that your life is clear of vines that don't belong, that want to take over everything that are in pursuit of you to take over everything unrelentlessly. That is how the enemy works, one vine at a time. So didn't really need to preach that. That would preach itself, but just a gentle and wondrous reminder from our Father to keep our gardens vine-free, entangled-free, to keep our lives out of the entanglement of sin. Amen? Amen. I have a message today called Time Travelers. Time Travelers. Uh, I want to see power in the church. I long to see power in the church. It's obvious from what's happening around us that we need power in the church. But the real question is, do we want it? Because with great power comes great responsibility, right? But more than that, are we willing to do what it takes to lay hold of God's power in the church? What does that have to do with being a time traveler? Well, each day, 24 hours, time. Each minute, 60 seconds. Um, days, weeks, years. Everything is time. We live by time. Um, we, I, I wrote it, we spend time, we run out of time, we save time, we lose time. Some people are on borrowed time, many have too much time on their hands, 
and some don't have enough time. So time is a commodity that is important, and it's especially important to the Lord. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through a, 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 what I think is a very powerful study on time. Now, please understand that in God there is no time. To him, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Eternity is timeless. But we are a linear people where God sees my whole life like a ball of yarn wrapped, in, uh, wrapped all together in his hand. He sees my life beginning to end the whole ball. But we as humanity see that ball of yarn one moment at a time. Just, we, don't, we don't see the whole ball. We, we just see one moment at a time. So if we're seeing one moment at a time, that means every moment is important. So then we have a caution about time in Scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Be very, I like that, not just careful, be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Hmm. Now, maybe you might think that not all days are evil. After all, this was Paul talking, and back in Paul's day, there was persecution of the church back then. Uh, that, was, that was just Paul's day. That wasn't my day. That's not our day. Our days aren't evil. We have good days, days at the beach, days for a cookout, days with family, Christmas, Easter, holidays, Fourth of July fireworks. These are great days. These are not evil days. These are good days. Hmm. Wrong. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And it's, it's such a critical idea. A, tr a critical truth that we need to understand. So let me take you to Galatians 3, verses 3 and 4. Galatians 3, 3 and 4. Paul again, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from what? The present evil age according to the will of God and Father. Jesus gave himself to rescue us from this evil age. One of the reasons that Christ went to the cross was to rescue us from what is called this evil age. That's the time we live in. The age he's talking about stretches from Paul's day to the time when Christ will return to establish his kingdom. So if the age is evil, then the days within the age are also evil. We live in evil days. Now, I think the days are more evil now than they were 30 years ago or 50 years ago. There's more manifested evil in our days. It's more prevalent. The unholy, the hate, the unrighteousness, the sin, the obvious defiant sin of people who claim abortion is okay, it's not. That the LBTQ community is entitled to certain rights. They're not. They're, they're, they're sinners needing saved by grace, just like I am. If, if I were committing a sexual sin, I would be a sinner in need of grace. And that's all they're doing, is committing sexual sin. No more, no less, but it's wrong. And that defiance is definitely based in evil. But Paul talked about something about the days of evil in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, simply stand. So Paul says there's an evil day. We need to be constantly walking 
in that spiritual armor. This is our protection from the evil age. This is not an option or something that only needs to be done once in a while. Jesus went to the cross to provide us with more than a one-time salvation experience. His work is ongoing in our lives. And he provided us with this armor that we need to rescue us from this present age. We don't need to be affected by the evil in the age or the evil day. So when will this evil day come that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6? Every time you wake up in the morning, the evil day has come. That's why the armor is so important. The evil day is not on its way. It's here. Right now, here. And as God's people, we need to be prepared for what comes ahead in that day. We are the ones who should be walking in victory in our days over the challenges we face that the world around us can't understand. How else could I walk in victory? How else if not by Christ and the spirit that he gave us? If every day is evil, then Christ in every day brings me the victory. Hear that. If every day is evil, then every day in Christ gives me the ability to walk in victory and righteousness, in right thinking, right standing, right speaking, right acting, right everything, in the righteousness of God. Every day can be victorious. But it begs the question, what makes something evil? What makes the day evil? Good question. And God spoke to my heart. Because this is how I operate with God. I will sit at my desk and he'll, he'll pour into me through the Holy Spirit. But I ask him questions. Well, Lord, what, what makes a day evil? If, if your word says that there's an evil day, because the days are evil. That's what he said in Ephesians 5. The days are evil. What will God show me? What makes the day evil? Okay. All right, so let me give you Matthew 12, 35. Matthew 12, 35. The good man brings forth good things. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. The Bible is clear. What makes something good or evil isn't the thing itself, usually. It's all based on who the owner is. Things are evil simply because they're owned by an evil thing. Good things are owned by a good man. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So if it's all about the owner, what about the age we live in? Easy. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Remember in Galatians, Paul said that Jesus gave his life for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. And everything in that evil age, every day in that evil age is an evil day. Who owns the evil age? The God of this age. Satan is the owner of this age. The age is evil because the owner is evil. The devil is called the God of this age. And according to scripture, this age will last until the return of Christ. This age, again, is evil because Satan, the owner, is evil. But the real question is, what can we do about it? Well, if we go back to think about Ephesians 5, be very careful how you live. It says we're to redeem the days, must making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We're told that this age requires us to be so careful 
We, we, we have to walk in wisdom. Paul goes on to explain what he means by this, that we should be making the most of every opportunity. Now, this is an interesting phrase that the English translation doesn't do justice in. It literally means redeeming or buying back the time. As Christians, we need to be purchasing the time back. Look at it this way. All of the time, all time was created by God and for God. But because of Adam's fall, Satan has taken over the age, and it's now up to us to redeem that time. Now, how do we redeem time? It is so easy. We just put Christ in it. We put Christ in our time. We talk about him, we sing about him, we pray to him, we think about him, we read his word, we fellowship with him, we walk righteously alongside of him, we walk in the power of the spirit, we operate in the power of the spirit. That's how we redeem time. It is such an easy thing to do what we're told to do, to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And we're supposed to redeem or buy back the time. Every time I have lunch with someone and we talk about Jesus, I've redeemed that time. Every time I pray, I've redeemed it. Every time I praise him, I redeem it. Every time I'm in his word, I redeem that time. Even when I sleep, when I go to sleep, my prayer every night is, God, be the Lord of my thoughts and my dreams. You be the master of my thoughts and my dreams. I never have bad dreams. I can't remember the last time I had a bad dream because I commit my thoughts and my dreams to the lordship of Jesus Christ. I allow him to be the Lord of my thoughts and dreams, even when I'm sleeping, so that all the time I'm sleeping, I'm redeeming the time because I've submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ uh, in my mind and in my dreams. Now, that's awesome. When I wake up, I commit my day to him, and I'm redeeming that time. And so my days, the days out there might be evil, but my days are righteous. Not that I'm righteous, but I create an atmosphere of righteousness around my day. When I talk about Jesus or walk with Jesus, when I witness or testify to him, when I tape the TV show, when I teach Bible study, of course, I'm redeeming time. But it's more than just doing it's the attitude that I always have a song in my heart about him. I, I, I always have him on my mind. Now, I'm not 24-7, oh, I'm talking Jesus, or I'm not doing anything like that. But I stay in an attitude that's all about Christ. Oh, I'm tempted. I, I am tempted to sin, and there are times that I do that I give into that temptation but I quickly repent, confess, repent, and move on with my bad self. I've redeemed the time, even out of sin. It's, it's so easy. So this leads me to some obvious kind of conclusions. If something can be bought and sold, it's a commodity. Think about time. In both scripture and our language, Many financial terms are associated with time. Let me roll them again. Spend time, run out of time, save time, lose time. People want to live on borrowed time. Many have too much time on their hands. Some don't have enough time. Time is a commodity, and we're exhorted and encouraged to purchase time because the days are evil. What does all this have to do with power in the church? The fact is we have to open our space needed for power. See, if I walk in the evil and don't redeem the time, I'm powerless in those moments. Uh, I'm, I'm powerless if I'm not walking in the redemption of time. But when I'm in redeemed time, when I have purchase the time, I have power. I have power. Through the Holy Spirit, we have power. And we have to engage this time. 
That's why fellowship is so important. That's why going to church is so important. That's why talking about Jesus. You know, I, I have friends. We, we joke about this all the time. A bunch of us, a few of us, a group of us, go on vacation every summer to Ocean City, Maryland. Um, there are 12 going this year. And the majority of them love to do devotions every evening. Now, let me, almost all of them enjoy devotions in the evening as a group. I kind of balk at it. And it's become the biggest joke. Because it's my job, please understand, it's a great job. I love my job. Teaching, preaching, studying, going through the word, uh, testifying about his word, coming on TV, doing Bible studies. I do six messages every week. I do a message for my website. I do a message for Bible study. I do a message for the TV show. I do a message when I preach. And then I do a message for um, a, a sober living house that I do a Bible study in once a week with those women. So I do messages constantly. So when I go on vacation, I don't always want to do a message because that's my job. I love his word. <laughs> but that's become the joke. Then I'll go out on the porch while they do devotions. But we have to understand that all they are doing is redeeming time. Even when we're at the beach, there's a hunger to redeem time to make the time important and significant so that it becomes significant and important enough to me to be a part of it when they do devotions. I don't have to lead them. I can just soak in what someone else is teaching or sharing at that time. And at that moment, we are redeeming the time even at the beach. It's not hard. It's not hard. It's really simple. Unless we open up time for him nothing will be done for him we need to spend time in the presence of the Lord that's where our strength is in him and in the power of the Holy Spirit is where our strength comes from I have everything I need in the face of all the evil days ahead of me. That's what it means to be a time traveler. Traveling through time with redemption in mind. Traveling through time with redemption in mind. Now God has given it to us to redeem the days. He has redeemed us completely and totally. We are redeemed. We have been bought by the blood of Christ that issue is done and solved and complete and total. I don't have to work for my salvation. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to earn my salvation. It is a free gift of Jesus Christ who has already paid the price for me. And I have been purchased by the blood of the lamb. But he has given it to us to then operate in that salvation to operate in his redemption by redeeming the time, making the most of every opportunity or redeeming the time because the days are evil. And the days are evil because we're in an evil age. And the age is evil because of the one who owns the age. The owner of the age is Satan. So Satan is evil, the age is evil, and the days within the age are evil. But God gave you and I the great privilege, the awesome privilege of redeeming time for him. Buying back time. Giving him time. Now, listen, I understand that God owns all time. All time is in God's hands. But there's an ownership to the time in this world. The world system, not the people, but the world system. And the God of this age owns the time. And that's what God said, that the time, I'm not saying the days are evil. God is saying the days are evil. I'm not saying the age is evil. God has said the age is evil. And God has said that Satan is the owner of the age, not me. I'm just following through scripture. But it's our joy and our responsibility to redeem or buy back that time. 
It's an easy thing to do. It doesn't take much effort to not walk in the evil days. This world's evil. There's evil all around. But I am not of this world. That's a bumper sticker most of us in my Bible study group have on our, on our back windshield. N-O-T-W, not of this world. My citizenship is in heaven. That's where my home is. I'm just a stranger and an alien in this land. I'm just a sojourner walking through the time, this journey. I, I don't belong here. But while I'm here, I'm going to make the most of what I can for him. It's not much that he asks of us to make the most of our time for him. After all, he gave the most of what he had for us, his very life on the cross. And it's the very smallest thing I can do to redeem time back for him. If you do not know who this Jesus is who bought you bought you back from the evil one, from Satan, bought you back from sin and death and hell and the grave. If you do not know this amazing love that Jesus wants to bestow and give to you freely, will you let us help you find him? Oh, he died for relationship with you. Literally, he died just to have a relationship with you. He loves you with a love unspeakable, immeasurable, immutable, and powerful. Call us, get on the website, let us help you. He's painting a picture of your life with his, one brushstroke at a time. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.